embark on an extraordinary journey as we delve into the gripping tale of the June 8, 1937 solar eclipse of the Sun, where a brave team of Navy and scientists pushed the boundaries of human resilience and exploration. For nearly 45 days, they battled against the elements, confronted uncertainty, coped with monotony, endured injuries and illnesses, tackled technical glitches, encountered adversaries, and faced perplexing creatures and monstrous entities lurking in the depths of their remote island in the South Pacific. In this captivating account, you will primarily explore the unfiltered recollections of Lieutenant Dr. Herman Gross, intertwined with the public testimonies of Captain Helweg, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Mitchell, and NBC announcer George Hicks. Through their unedited narratives, you will gain an intimate understanding of the exhilarating and perilous experiences that the expeditioners encountered. Immerse yourself in the narrative and witness the unfolding events, both within their secluded world and the broader context of the surrounding globe. Prepare to be captivated by this first-hand account of survival and the triumph of the human spirit. Day 1, Thursday, May 6, 1937, Honolulu, Hawaii. That all-important day, May 6, of our sailing from the Hawaiian Islands, for the National Geographic Society United States Navy Eclipse Expedition, toward which our efforts had been bent for more than two months, dawned hot and still. A tropical rain the night before had made everything muggy and heavy. The clouds still hung threateningly over the tops of the mountains around Honolulu. As we hurried through the town in our little car, not much was said. Each was busy with his own thoughts checking over for the hundredth time all details to ensure that none of our 11 tons of scientific equipment, ranging from huge telescopic cameras to tiny stopwatches, had been overlooked in the rush of the last two weeks. Suddenly we made out the Avocet, a Navy seaplane tender assigned to the expedition, lying snugly alongside her dock on the waterfront. Her undisturbed, peaceful air, her smart appearance, her very evident readiness to go, cheered us tremendously. Her gear and equipment were stowed and lashed as only seamen can do it. Everything was trim and taut. We were ready. Ladies carried fragrant lays. The Royal Hawaiian Band was already in its place outboard of the gangway. Cars began to gather on the dock, and the National Broadcasting Company experts were busy rigging their portable equipment. Miki Aloha Paole, Mr. Tyson, and thanks for the assistance of your famous station in Hawaii, KGU. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now standing on the U.S. Navy Pier 5A in the tropical city of Honolulu, on the island of Oahu. Behind us lies the lovely harbor of Honolulu to our side, the Navy minesweeper, Avocet, tied at dock, gray and trip, with a huge four painted on her bow, loaded to the gunnels with supplies and equipment. The Aloha Tower of the harbor to our left with the clock at the top. Across Ala Moana Boulevard, buildings of the U.S. Army. With shaggy palms and coconut clusters beneath the fronds, a row of fuzzy, needled ironwood trees, a royal poinciana with the curved bean pods, and an African daisy tree with its whole head full of large red blossoms, like giant tulips, and around them, growing a hedge of the native hibiscus with open-mouthed red flowers carelessly strewn on all sides. Up the street, the city of Honolulu with automobiles, streetcars, stores, and busy pedestrians, and the old Iolani Palace of the ancient Hawaiian monarchy, now used as the governor's buildings, and between them, seeming to grow out of the streets, the serrata green head of Punchbowl Mountain, with its shoal top cut off by a ragged butcher knife. For the first time, we have gathered together all of the members of the National Geographic Society, U.S. Navy, Solar Eclipse Expedition of 1937. We have come from all parts of the United States. Nine scientists, one photographer, two radio engineers, one radio announcer now speaking, a naval surgeon, the captain of our naval ship, and 59 members in the crew. We will set sail for a 1,700-mile trip southward and west from Hawaii, across the equator, and only 500 miles east of the international date line, to the lonely and uninhabited Phoenix Islands, set in the heated equatorial waters of the South Seas, to observe the total eclipse of the sun on June 8th of this year. It is a typical Hawaiian farewell, or aloha, doubly interesting to the islanders because of the unusualness of this expedition. Sailors, wives, and sweethearts, Friends and relatives of the scientists, the whole town, even the famous Royal Hawaiian Band of Honolulu are here to send us on our way. We were given a grand send-off to the strains of Aloha by the Royal Hawaiian Band. It was quite thrilling, but nonetheless a little depressing, for we could not know what luck had in store of us. 
Again, the soft Hawaiian music, a few last earnest goodbyes, and then a sharp all on board, and then stand by your lines. We got underway at 11.15 a.m. after the radio broadcast from Pier 5A. There was no difficulty in swinging astern and turning about and making for the open sea. Everything was calm and serene until we got outside of the breakwater, and then this little old bucket began to roll, and when I say roll, I mean roll. It wasn't long before chow time, and we all filed in for some good old seagoing food. To our surprise, the steward even had ice cream for dessert. I spent the afternoon trying to take a nap in the chart house, but there was so darned much roll that I couldn't get a wink in, and I actually believe I was worse off than before I turned in. I felt just a little uncertain, and I began to drool just a little bit, but did not actually become nauseated. Over the ship's radio, an emergency broadcast echoed the ship. This is just in from Naval Air Station, Lakehurst, New Jersey. At 7.35 New Jersey local time, the German airship Hindenburg unexpectedly exploded into a fireball during a routine landing at the station. I now turn you over to Herb Morrison of WLS Radio's broadcast. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. They backed motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get this started. Get this started. It's flashing. And it's flashing. It's flashing. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's running, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks between that this is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's flashing. Plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. It's smoke and it's flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just speeding around it. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. I, I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because they, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. One moment. Back to your regularly NBC scheduled program. I wasn't in any too good spirits and turned in early, but was up several times during the night and went on the bridge. Day 2, Friday, May 7th, 1937. Got up from my careening cot at 6 o'clock and down to breakfast. Bacon and eggs for breakfast at 7 and then waited until all hands had eaten and then at 8.30 took the members of the expedition on the fossil and put them through some setting up exercises. We have had a lot of roll on this old can and Mr. Brown of the NBC has not been doing so well. At noon of the second day out, the sun was neither north nor south of us, but exactly in the zenith. Several of us left our noon meal to check this unusual spectacle. The dictionary has a name for us, Asians, that is, beings who cast no shadows. The second night out at dinner, Dr. Herman A. Gross, the Navy surgeon, and I were spinning yarns about China. Captain, do you remember that big male buoy just outside of Chinwangtao? Why, yes, doctor, but I never put any letters in it. I always felt that those Chinese pirates stole half of the letters. Someone interrupted with, Captain, what does a male buoy look like? What are they for? Oh, down here, they are big yellow buoys with large blue M's painted on their sides, just like the Matson Line's ship stacks. You put your letters in the buoy, and the next ship picks them up. The doctor abruptly changed the subject. Nothing further was said about the male buoy, but later into the night, members of the expedition were busily writing letters and asking what kind of stamps had to be used on male buoy letters. Rather an uneventful day. The night was bad, and I enjoyed very little sleep in the chart house. The 12 of us slept in one room athwart ship, in size about 15 by 25 feet. Going south from Honolulu, we had a following breeze, with the result that the heat from the engine room was wafted just abaft to our commodious quarters, where we had about as much privacy as the proverbial goldfish. Day 3, Saturday, May 8th, 1937. Up early and to breakfast. Went down to see Brown and gave him some magnesium sulfate and got him up on deck for some good hot soup and crackers. It is surprising that he should be feeling so bad because he spent eight years in the Navy as a kid and the sea never used to bother him. Took the men out on deck again at 8.30 for their setting up exercises. A little longer this time and they all seemed to follow very well. We passed through the usual number of tropical showers. Some were real resin squalls. But between squalls, the sun came out hotter than ever. 
Every morning early, I had the boatswain's mate hook up the fire hose and hit me with it at about five feet. I could never convince the others of the stimulating effect of that salt water shower delivered with a fire hose and plenty of pressure. The polywogs overtook the shellbacks today and had them lashed to stanchions and deck. I pity them when we cross the line. Took a little nap just aft of the bridge in the afternoon and got about two hours of good sleep. Life on board was easy going and peaceful. All hands tried to keep occupied. After dinner every night, the card players got underway. Others went on the bridge to look at the ever beautiful panorama. Tropical stars from the dark deck of a ship at sea are one of nature's most inspiring sights. I am going to sleep down below in Captain Helweg's room this evening. Day four, Sunday, May 9th, 1937. For once and at last, I have really had a good night's sleep. I slept in an upper Pullman bunk in Captain Helweg's cabin, and it was much better than careening around on the deck of the chart house. We have had fairly nice weather, and except for a very decided roll which is hitting us quite severely, we have been having a rather easy time of it. Only Brown remains a little ill at ease. We couldn't have our daily setting up exercises this morning because of showers and the severe roll which came up just at our scheduled time. The technicians had quite a busy day of it getting their equipment ready for test. Tomorrow, they are going to broadcast directly from the crew's mess hall and release it to the NBC networks. George Hicks has been very busy getting talent arranged and his program should be very interesting, if anyone is listening in. To bed at 10.45 after swapping stories in the wardroom. Day 5, Monday, May 10th, 1937. The sea has quieted down a whole lot and everybody seems to be enjoying the cruise much more than the first few days out. Today at 2 o'clock, George Hicks and the boys of the crew gave a program which was released to the NBC networks on the mainland. It apparently was a very good program, that is. It was timed just right. These radio men have quite a job. They get a program all fixed up, and then they have to cut it and cut it until they get it down for the proper time. In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, we intend to present the program in connection with the total eclipse of the sun. We ask your indulgence for just a moment, please. From the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, first here are the two native surf boys, hired by Captain Helwig. We go over the side or into the sea, clear lines are for emergencies when we land on the island. Kale Ahia and Jacobi Haile. Uh, are you boys Hawaiian? Yes, Mr. Hick. Well, Connie, aren't you afraid to swim around the reefs where the sharks are? No, I'm not afraid. Did you ever have a shark come after you? Yes, I did. What did you do? Swam up fast and jumped out of the water. Well, uh, did you ever get bit? No. When you get bit, the shark takes something with him. You see, I'm all here. Yeah, I see you are. Well, now, tell me about the stingaree. We call it sea bass. It is big, six feet, and swims 60 miles an hour. When he catches you, he whips his tail around you and cuts you to pieces. He has barbs on the tail. Then there is the kaku, what do you call barracuda. We are more afraid of these than sharks. Mike, I find a song about an island girl. Thank you, boy. Thank you. Ah, now let's see if we have any capybara swing harmonicas or uh, Bing Crosby's on this crew. Let's call on fireman third class Carl Schutz. Carl, where are you from? Wichita, Kansas. Oh, what are you going to try first, Carl? Wall Street Rag. Let her go. And uh, here's Bill Wright, seaman first class. To call off a few figures, uh, Schutz plays the harmonica, and Alan the Jews harp in Turkey in the Straw. Dr. S.A. Mitchell of the University of Virginia, as the scientific leader of the National Geographic Navy Eclipse Party, our listeners would like a report from you, and perhaps you can tell me a little about an astronomer on a busman's holiday. Yes, Mr. Hicks. Since leaving Honolulu, we have been having a delightful lazy cruise. All of the members of the expedition are well, thanks to good food, plenty of sleep, and setting up exercise in the morning led by Dr. Grove. On account of our restricted quarters, not, not much can be done by the scientific personnel other than to perfect general plans. 
Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Now, our leader in charge of the men and equipment is a sea dog of 40 years' experience, Captain Frederick Helwig, Superintendent of the United States Naval Observatory. Captain, what have you to say about this sea voyage? I wish to say to all the families of this little ship, the Eclipse Expedition and the ship's personnel, everybody is in excellent condition, happy and healthy. We all send our love to those at home. With the long quartering sea and light to fresh breezes from the northeast, we are reeling off the knots rapidly. She rides it like a duck, and occasionally she takes a little over the side. Life on board is simple. Of course, the Navy must have its practical joke. So the hoary headed joke about the stopping of, at the mail boy has again been successfully played on the uninitiated. For the first two nights, members of the expedition were busily writing letters and asking what kind of stamps had to be used for mail boy letters. Who first discovered the hoax is not known, but letter writing abruptly ceased and no one bars any more stamps. All the expedition are excellent sailors, and few have missed even a single mess call. The doctor has setting up exercise every morning for all hands. We beg all hands at home to pull hard for a hot, cloudless sky on the morning of 8 June. Goodbye. Thank you, Captain Helwig. The entire ensemble of the Abbasset's Hillbilly Band, with Seaman Schaefer, Tullis, Charles, Bratton, Wright, Sanders, and Walsh singing, offer a country boy's version of music, even though they're stationed at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. All right, boys, make it good. <laughs> Music music. And that concludes, ladies and gentlemen, the auditions from the middle of the Pacific Ocean by the crew of the Navy Minesweeper Abbasset, carrying scientists of the National Geographic Navy Eclipse Party to the South Sea Islands. So far, I seem to be doing all right by myself as far as meals are concerned, and have only smoked two packages of cigarettes. I don't know whether I've gained any weight, but I certainly feel as though I have put on at least five pounds. 